and welcome more than anything else, uh, Mark and Mika. That's not really looking forward to hear what you say. What would you do if, after years of slavery, you had your freedom given back to you? And then what would you do if someone came to take it away from you? Would you run away and try and avoid them? Or would you stand and fight? And what if that decision for freedom didn't just affect you individually, not just the city that you lived in, or even the country that you belong to? What if that threat was a threat to your entire civilization as you knew it? Almost 100 years ago today, that threat was very real. It existed. And one man, the leader of Poland's newly regained republic, Marshal Joseph Piłsudski, was the person who had to bear the weight of that threat against the entire civilization of Europe. One man making decisions that could have altered the course of European history. One man who led the Polish forces against a horde of communist soldiers, hell-bent on capturing Poland, running through it onto Berlin, and with it, the whole of Western and Eastern Europe. One man. An incredible subject, and amazingly, a battle which, although it's been described as one of the most decisive and important of the 20th century, is not really understood uh, beyond Poland. And let's be in absolutely no doubt, the threat against civilization, European civilization, as we understand it today, was very, very real. As the tens of thousands of communist soldiers came pouring into, uh, across the Polish border, their commander, Tukhachevsky issued these orders. Soldiers of the Red Army, the time of reckoning has come. In the blood of the defeated Polish army, we will drown the criminal government of Pilsudski. Turn your eyes to the West. In the West, the fate of world revolution is being decided. Over the corpse of Poland lies the road to world conflagration. On our bayonets, we will bring happiness and peace to the toiling masses of mankind. The hour of attack has struck. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about the incredible pressure, the incredible danger, and the incredible decisions were made at that time so that a, a newly formed Polish army in a newly formed country somehow took the right decisions at the right time to defeat that very threat to our civilization. And we welcome everybody here tonight as well as everybody watching from around the world to tell that story. And we have somebody who is better qualified than almost anybody else to talk about it, uh, Dr. Jan Szumski, who I'd like to welcome to the stage. Jan is from the Polish Academy of Sciences. He speaks four languages, uh, he's an incredibly talented man. He's a Sovietologist and an expert in Polish-Russian relations. Jan, please, come to the stage. Please give Ran a big round of applause. So, Jan, we've got 40 minutes to talk about probably one of the most exciting, turbulent, uh, and difficult times in Polish history, and indeed the history of this entire region. Uh, let's maybe start with some context. I, I touched on the fact that Poland was a, a recently new country. It only started in 1918 on the 11th of November. Can you tell us about how that came to place? Well, uh, I guess we should start uh, with the situation um, uh, at the end of the First World War. It was the time of uh, political and social upheaval. Uh, it was the time when the old empires uh, fallen down, uh, like uh, Habsburg, um, German, Ottoman, and Russian Empire, and new states uh, emerged. I mean, new multinational and national states like uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, uh, Baltic states, uh, Finland, Hungary. Um, and uh, uh, at the same time, uh, mm, the Europe sparked uh, the wave of uh, uh, the revolutionary wave, uh, which resulted in uh, 
communist revolution in Russia in 1917, um, in uh, Finland in 1918, and uh, uh, in Germany, uh, Hungary, and uh, uh, Slovakia in 1990. Uh, in November 1917, or in October, it depends on style, uh, old or new, uh, I mean uh, Gregorian or uh, Julian style. So in uh, November 1917, uh, the Bolsheviks uh, seized power in Petrograd, which was the capital of the uh, Russia. And Poland up until that time, for well over 100 years, had been divided by into three countries, one of which was the Tsarist Empire of Russia, and the other two were? Uh, uh, I didn't mention uh, that the uh, Bolsheviks, uh, by the way, who were the Bolsheviks? My so Sovietologist friend told me <laughs> yesterday that they, the word itself means majority in Russia, or the, the people of the majority. Yeah, you're, uh, uh, you're partly right, because uh, Bolshevik was not the uh, religious or ethnic group. Um, Bolsheviks was the uh, part, the majority, yeah, you're right, the majority of the uh, social, uh, mm, Russian social uh, labor party, uh, which split in uh, 1903 on two parts, uh, Bolsheviks majority, and Mensheviks uh, minority. Uh, the leader of Bolsheviks, Vladimir Lenin, uh, uh, was a very effective man. So the Bolsheviks party uh, was small in number, mm, highly centralized, uh, and extremely uh, effective. Mm. Among uh, Bolsheviks, uh, we could find uh, Russians, uh, as well as uh, Poles, Germans. Felix Zizinski, for yeah. example. Yeah. Uh, Dzerzhinsky, Felix Dzerzhinsky, uh, and many other uh, peoples and nations from the former Russian Empire. And these were, these were brutal times, they were extremely bloody times, so the, uh, the revenge that these communists wreaked on their enemies, or political enemies, uh, was quite something. And of course there was a civil war going on in Russia for command of uh, Russia. Let's talk about that for a second. Well, when uh, Bolsheviks uh, came to power at the end of the uh, 1970, uh, in fact, they controlled uh, a very small territory of uh, Russia. Uh, there were a lot of uh, people, there were a lot of groups who were opposed to uh, Bolshevik, and uh, they were known as uh, whites, uh, in opposite to the uh, reds. And uh, mm, whites just want to read uh, uh, Bolsheviks from Russia. Uh, mm, during the civil war in Russia in 1918-1922, uh, 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 Bolshe the Bolsheviks uh, defeated uh, the most of their uh, internal enemies and uh, they started to uh, invade the Europe. Mm. So let's, come on, let's go back to Poland then in that case. We've got this turmoil in Russia, this constant sea of movement of peoples between the white and red armies, the whites backed by the allies uh, or former allied uh, countries of Britain and France, uh, overturned and defeated. And then you have this newly created country, Poland, which for so long had been divided up into three countries. How was it that, that Poland even <laughs> really managed to exist at such a turbulent time? They had uh, British boots and French rifles and Austrian ammunition, uh, and they faced this threat, this very existential threat. Um, how, how was it that the Polish uh, state was able, for example, to, to build an army capable of reacting to that? Uh, well, uh, Poland reborn uh, after 123 years of uh, slavery, uh, when it was uh, partitioned by uh, three uh, empires. I mean, uh, Prussia, Russia and Austria. So the Polish Commonwealth, uh, which existed in uh, 1569, uh, uh, 1795, uh, was reborn in some way. Uh, it consisted of uh, three partitions, uh, Austro-Hungarian, uh, Austro uh, German and uh, Russian. I would like to remind that uh, the First World War, uh, uh, during the First World War, 
poli poles uh, had to fight from the n different uh, sides. Yes. I mean, yeah, uh, as a soldier of the Russian army, uh, as a soldier of the uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, army, so uh, it was uh, it was really uh, it was really hard. Yep. Uh, but uh, coming back to your question about the uh, weapons, about the uh, even different uniforms, for example, the Polish army led it by uh, General Josef Haller, uh, which was formed in, the, uh, in France. Uh, the soldiers and officers, uh, they were wearing a, a blue uniform, mm. so uh, they were called as a blue army. Yeah. Mm. So uh, even this aspect might be uh, interesting. We also have the troops of the Red Army who were often using captured uh, weaponry from the White Armies they've been fighting, but were essentially a horde. I mean, a horde was the word that was used to describe them by their own commander. Uh, ironically, the uh, Red Army uh, were led by the uh, noblemen, uh, mostly by the noblemen, by the former uh, Tsarist uh, Russian uh, officers, and one of these uh, officers was uh, Mikhail Tukhachevsky. Uh, Mikhail Tukhachevsky, uh, who was born near the Smolensk, uh, he was a Russian officer. He took part in a uh, First World War, uh, take uh, into a prison, and uh, it's an unbelievable story. Uh, he shared uh, the cell with the future president of the France, the, pr the president of the Fifth Republic, Charles de Gaulle. Mm. So he sh they shared the same, uh, the same cell, and uh, as the allies, of course. And a few years later, uh, they met uh, as enemies from the opposite side. Yeah, uh, let's, let's talk about some of these fascinating characters. So uh, for those of you at home who don't know so much about Polish history, you have to understand that this was a, a fascinating time of an almost romantic quality of intrigue about it. You had these noblemen, you had people f switching sides and fighting for different sides. You had these extravagant, colorful figures. You had, as you just reminded, fighting for the Russian army. The officer corps was very much noblemen who had either been deposed or um, uh, whose families had lost everything they had, and yet they were still fighting for their country. And above all, you have officers who were schooled in these quite old-fashioned uh, style of warfare where the cavalry and the saber were still important, where individual bravery was, was very important. Let's talk about some of these colorful characters. We, we, we'll come back to de Gaulle, I think. Let's focus on Marshal Joseph Pilsudski, uh, the leader of this reborn Poland. Uh, there is no doubt uh, it was the um, one of the uh, famous one of the most outstanding uh, figures in the history of Poland uh, in particular uh, during the uh, Soviet Polish war uh, he played a decisive role uh, in the Polish victory uh, on on Bolsheviks uh, Józef Piłsudski was born in gr and grew up in a, a Russian partition uh, uh, on nowadays uh, territory of uh, Lithuania, but uh, that time it was a uh, Russian Empire. So he uh, spoke Russian, he spoke a few uh, languages such as Belarusian, f German, French, uh, um, but uh, he'd not, he did he, not, he, um, Pilsudski uh, deeply understood the nature of the uh, Russian politics. Uh, he understood that a Russian politics, whether uh, red or white, uh, would uh, always be imperial, uh, would uh, threaten Poland and uh, other countries uh, between Russia and Germany. Uh, I mean, Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Finland. By the way, uh, Finland was the first country uh, uh, who had to face with the Bolshevik aggression. Mm. Uh, I just want to remind that uh, when Bolshevik came to power in November 1970, uh, a few uh, months later, a few weeks later, on December uh, 6, 1970, um, uh, Finnish parliament, Finnish senate, uh, proclaimed the full independence of uh, Finland and the uh, Bolsheviks government uh, recognized the Finnish uh, independence 
And at the same time, uh, Finnish communists uh, made a coup d'etat. Uh, Bolsheviks government uh, sent the Bolshevik troops and uh, fleet. Uh, uh, and uh, that way, the civil war in uh, Finland was uh, uh, started. Mm. So the first uh, state who had to, who had f uh, to face uh, Bolshevik uh, aggression was uh, paradoxically Finland. Which uh, brings us neatly on to Mika as well, and that was something that uh, Mika and Mark discussed with the Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki just earlier today. So you have this character Pilsudski, this, uh, this gaunt imperial man with his military uniform wearing a simple tunic, uh, who's the leader of Poland. And then you have, uh, let's run through a few of the key characters. We've got Trotsky, this uh, flamboyant, energetic, uh, incredible man who's the head of the, uh, the Russian army. Uh, Leon Trotsky, born as a uh, labor uh, Davidovich Bronstein, uh, it was his real name, uh, was one of the um, most important uh, uh, figures in a um, Bolshevik political bureau. Uh, he was uh, uh, Marxist, uh, one of the uh, theoretical of the Marxism, but uh, the most important uh, is uh, that he uh, created, he formed a Red Army. Uh, he took a position of the uh, People's Commissar of uh, the Military and uh, Naval Affairs, and uh, uh, he's responsible for the, not only for the organizing the Red Army, he's responsible for the uh, mass uh, executes uh, which took place in Soviet Russia during yes. the Civil War. So uh, he was, I would say, the uh, person number one in terms of uh, military affairs in uh, Soviet Russia. And this was a man who somehow managed to keep the Soviet armies operating despite the very long supply chains and the great difficulty of recommunication. This was a, a very energetic, effervescent uh, person. Let's come back to Tukhachevsky in that case, another example of somebody, uh, an incredible figure in Russian history, in Russian military history. Uh, Tukhachevsky was 27 when he led the Soviet armies uh, across the Polish border. And you mentioned he'd been in a, shared the same cell with de Gaulle. Let's talk about him for a second. Yeah, he was pretty young uh, during the First World War. Uh, he was taken in an, into the German prison and uh, he shared the, the same cell with the uh, captain Charles de Gaulle. And uh, on uh, 1920, uh, they meet uh, once again as the enemies uh, on the opposite side uh, uh, in, in that war, so uh, Charles de Gaulle, uh, with the rank of major of the Polish army, uh, he was an instructor. Uh, inst he was a member of the French mission in Poland and instructor of the um, mm, Polish uh, infantry. Uh, he uh, took part in uh, some uh, battles, and what is interesting that uh, Charles de Gaulle uh, was distinguished, uh, was honored with the. Uh, highest Polish uh, uh, military uh, decoration, uh, the Virtuti Militari. Mm. And his statue today adorns uh, Ronda de Gola yeah. uh, in the city centre. Uh, let's talk about two more key figures in this conflict before we go on to the actual battle itself and the Battle of Warsaw. Uh, Joseph Stalin, a name that will be familiar to many in the room. Uh, what role did he play within the Polish conflict overall? Uh, in fact, he didn't play the decisive role in the uh, Polish-Soviet war. Uh, he was um, kind of uh, political advisor uh, of the uh, military commander uh, Igorov, who 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 led the um, who led the uh, uh, southwestern front. Uh, Stalin, uh, with his uh, front, stuck. Uh, uh, not far from uh, Lvov, uh, he, uh, Stalin rejected uh, mm. uh, execute to execute um, Tuhachevsky and uh, Trotsky's order. And uh, after the uh, war, uh, Stalin and Tukhachevsky uh, blame, uh, blamed themselves uh, for the Red Army defeated uh, 
uh, on, uh, during the Battle of uh, Warsaw. So we're not going to talk about Stalin very much, but when you think about what happened to Poland uh, during the Second World War and indeed after the Second World War, you have to remember that Stalin had quite a lot of animosity towards Poland. It had, after all, defeated the communist objectives, and he got into a lot of trouble for that. And, of course, uh, Tukhachevsky was executed by Stalin in the great purges of his Red Army officers in uh, 1939. 1937. Right? 37. That's why he's the historian and I'm the guy who asked the questions. Let's talk about one last guy, uh, Buden, uh, another uh, very colorful figure in the Russian army that's now uh, racing across the Polish border. Uh, Buden was uh, some kind of exception. He was not a nobleman. He uh, didn't have a, um, noble ancestry, um, but he was a very affected uh, cavalryman. So he started uh, as a Russian soldier, uh, as a Russian uh, uh, officer, and uh, under Bolshevik rules, uh, he became a, a commander of the first cavalry army, uh, which uh, um, which was known as uh, as a very brutal uh, and um, bloody army. Mm. Uh, I would strongly suggest to read the. Uh, a novel uh, entitled the, uh, uh, the Cavalry Army. Uh, the original uh, title is uh, Konarmia, which was written by the uh, Russian Jewish uh, writer Isaac Babel uh, in uh, 1920. So he, uh, he described the, um, the, 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 the rapes, the anti Semitimes in the uh, First Cavalry Army. And uh, so it's, it's quite, quite interesting. It's again, it's, uh, it's very difficult to describe uh, or even really understand just the sheer barbarity of these troops that were in this Russian army. They were half starved, they were many of them suffering from dysentery, uh, badly armed, uh, sent into battles that were extremely costly, and of course, as you mentioned, raping and murdering uh, Polish army officers, local landowners, anyone who they construed would be uh, against the communist cause and causing chaos wherever. And that was something that sent fear into the troops that they faced on the battlefield and the populations that they were coming to attack. Well, we've talked about some of these colorful, charismatic characters that are now in this Russian army, this Soviet Red Army, coming across the border. So let's get on to the battles. Now, uh, there were many battles throughout the course, uh, course of this period, and we haven't got enough time to go into all of them, but let's, let's just talk about how this conflict truly began. Okay. Well, there were, as you have mentioned, there were a lot of uh, battles. The uh, war began on uh, 1990, but the uh, active stage of war uh, began um, from the uh, Kievan uh, operation, Kiev operation, uh, uh, and on April, which took place on uh, on April 1920. So uh, it was the time when the uh, Petlura Pilsudski Pact uh, was signed in uh, Warsaw. Uh, that means that uh, joint Polish Ukrainian uh, forces uh, counterattacked the uh, Bolsheviks. Uh, and uh, on 7th of May, uh, they liberated, they captured Kiev. Mm, uh, unfortunately, a few, late, a few weeks later, uh, Bolsheviks counterattacked, and uh, uh, Polish forces uh, were falling back uh, on July and August. And uh, at the beginning of August, uh, Red Army uh, approached Warsaw. Yeah, so they were quite. It was relatively easy for them to attack, and once they gained the momentum, as so often in the battles throughout this period, these were battles of movement. Uh, they weren't trench warfare, uh, warfare as the as the First World War had proved. These were battles where the horse was still important. So let's let's talk about that attack then, uh, as they come through to Warsaw. What did it look like? What kind of major battles were fought, and what kind of casualties were suffered by both sides before the Red Army got to Warsaw? Well, the situation was really dramatic, uh, was really dangerous for the, uh, not only for the citizens of Warsaw, but uh, to a great extent for the, uh, for the Poland, for the Polish uh, statehood. So the uh, Polish military commanders, uh, like uh, Commander-in-Chief uh, Józef Piłsudski, um, uh, Tadeusz, General Tadeusz Rozwodowski, who was the uh, chief of the uh, Polish general staff and uh, other commanders, uh, 
uh, like uh, um, Kazimierz Sonskowski, who was the Ministry of War, and, and many others, um, they developed a genuine plan. Uh, now historians argued uh, who was the author of this plan, who developed this plan, uh, Józef Piłsudski or Tadeusz uh, Rozwodowski. Uh, honestly, it doesn't matter. Uh, we win as a one nation, we win as a one uh, army, and this is the most important. But coming back to the uh, Battle of uh, Warsaw, uh, mm. well, before we get there, Jan, I want to just talk about the, the state of Polish troops. So you have to understand we're, tonight's event is about taking difficult decisions at difficult times, and uh, the Polish army are being pushed back, and despite uh, huge efforts by the officers to try and pause that, that Russian advance, uh, there really seems to be nothing stopping them. There's this real sense that for some reason they can't regain the initiative. Uh, and there's panic and fear in the air, isn't there? As, for example, uh, when they do counterattack, they find the bodies of the officers that have been uh, murdered and tortured. And uh, if you can imagine, if you're a Polish officer and you, you see someone you might know, for example, having been murdered and tortured, you'd, you'd start to worry about what would happen to you. Desertion starts to rise uh, in the ranks as other people get, get, get scared of what could happen. So let's talk about that sense of fear, both in the army and indeed in the population of Warsaw, uh, as the Red Army gets closer. I guess that uh, Polish citizenship, uh, the citizens of Warsaw, uh, were uh, well informed about the, uh, about the murders, about the tortures, uh, which was made by the, uh, about this, by the soldiers of the uh, uh, Red Army. Uh, there is no doubt uh, people were scared. Uh, there is no doubt uh, there was a fear. But uh, it seems to me that uh, everyone, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, they uh, understood that it was the time to defend uh, not their life, not their uh, home, but the Polish statehood uh, at all. Mm. And um, the Russians, of course, know that if they can capture Warsaw, that means Poland will in almost certainty fall, and then that means they can get to Berlin. There's, there's this real sense as well. However, their attack had been so fast and so far that their supply lines start to dry up and it becomes harder for them to resupply their troops. So let's talk about the two armies that face each other off on the eastern side of the Vistula River. Uh, how many soldiers did the Polish army have and how many soldiers did the Russian army have? Uh, honestly speaking, it's very hard to uh, estimate the uh, um, strength uh, of the both sides because the Soviet and uh, Russian source sources um, says uh, says that uh, said that uh, it was uh, approximately uh, Tuhachevsky uh, claimed that uh, that he had uh, approximately uh, 7,500 people uh, who can uh, fight. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure uh, if it was true. So uh, the different sources uh, show us the different uh, numbers. Uh, what is pretty sure that the Red Army outnumber uh, Polish, now, uh, Poli Polish, uh, Polish uh, uh, army. Uh, there is no doubt. So you, you've got an outnumbered uh, Polish army that's completely exhausted by the marching it's had to do in, in full retreat to get back to this position. Now, with its backs to the capital city that it must defend, if it's going to be able to save its country. Uh, you also have to the north Buden and his cavalry, this, this flamboyant cavalry commander that have actually uh, gone deeper into Polish territory and are now heading north of Warsaw. Let's talk about them. Uh, the Soviet troops, the Soviet army, uh, in fact, it was the Red Army. The Red Army uh, were divided into two fronts. Uh, the uh, Western Front, uh, led by Tukhachevsky, uh, and the... Uh, Southwestern Front, led by Kamenev, uh, with the Stalin as a uh, political uh, advisor. So uh, I didn't mention that the main goal of the Bolshevik Revolution was not the taking power in Russia. They dreamed about the uh, world revolution, about the export uh, of the revolution on the West. So uh, the main goal was to was the. Uh, to seize power in Berlin, to unite the underdeveloped and agrarian Russia with the highly developed uh, Germany, and after that to spread communism. So Stalin 
when he was near the uh, when he was uh, when he stuck uh, near the Lvov, uh, he dreamed about uh, count, uh, he dreamed about the uh, Western countries, about the Austria, Hungary, and uh, other Western countries. So uh, he he thought that uh, Tuhachevsky uh, will capture uh, Warsaw during next uh, few days. Mm. Uh, it was his uh, great mistake. Indeed, we're talking about people with uh, very deep convictions, uh, fighting a battle that is really quite existential, and making decisions that could alter the course of history, and uh, I think we can be very grateful that Stalin decided to focus on Lvov uh, rather than Warsaw. Um, so you have Marshal Pisutsky, who is leading Poland, and he is facing uh, this, this horde, this, this conflagration right outside the city gates. Everything doesn't seem to have been working up until this stage. Uh, what do you think the pressure he was under, how did that affect him? For example, it was said that he became, uh, you know, it was a very enormous amount of pressure on him. So how did he manage to deal with that much responsibility on his shoulders? That's true. Uh, Pilsudski and uh, his allies, his generals, uh, had to work in extremely uh, difficult conditions. Uh, they had to uh, decide about the um, fates of the whole Poland, uh, maybe even not the whole Poland, the whole uh, Eastern Europe, uh, in extremely in a in, in extremely difficult uh, conditions. And by the way, we uh, owed uh, our victory uh, to the strategic uh, genius of uh, Polish military commanders. Uh, and uh, their decision uh, affected, as I have mentioned, not only Poland, but mm. uh, to a great extent uh, the West European countries for the next uh, 20 years. Yes. So, uh, Marshal Pisutski, uh, as I mentioned, uh, developed a genuine plan uh, to contra, uh, counter attack uh, Bolsheviks from the south. Uh, there were a gap between uh, southwestern and uh, western front. So uh, he made a genuine maneuver and uh, he forced uh, Red Army, Red, Fo um, Red Army to retreat uh, under the uh, River Neman line. Uh, by the way, uh, the next uh, decisive uh, battle took place in a triangular uh, Sovalki, Grodno, and Białystok. Uh, it was the battle on the river Neman. Uh, Tuachevsky was tried to uh, establish uh, the defense, but it was too late. Yes, so as so often, uh, just gaining the momentum was enough to start being able to push people back. The Poles were also aided by their ability to decipher uh, Russian military communications by radio. Uh, let's talk about that, because that has an interesting echo for the Second World War. Uh, many people will know, uh, although it's not often understood, that in fact the Enigma, the German uh, military codes, were broken by Polish cryptographers uh, just here in the south of Warsaw. So let's, let's talk about that. How decisive a role was the ability to crack the Russian communications? Yeah, it's a, a good idea to uh, remind uh, mm, the Polish mathemat mathematicians, uh, the Polish scientists, uh, who also fought uh, in Polish army by his knowledge, um, um, by his uh, mathematici mathematician uh, abilities. So one of them was uh, Wacław Sierpiński, who uh, it was the one uh, who uh, cracked the uh, Bolshevik code. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't remember uh, what was, th what was the exactly the machine, the code, but uh, the Polish army, the Polish military commander uh, knew about uh, every step uh, uh, which was made by the uh, Bolsheviks. So uh, it helped uh, Polish army uh, Pilsudski uh, read these uh, um, dispatches. Uh, he didn't need the translator. He 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 know he knew he know uh, um, mm. and he spoke Russian as well. So here you have Joseph Pilsudski somehow defeating 
this Soviet army on the border of uh, Warsaw and then rolling the army back, turning it back so that the uh, Russian leadership had to finally admit that their plan to conquer Berlin and with it uh, Europe and with that the world uh, would not be achieved by military means on this occasion. But of course Stalin would be back uh, in the region again 20 years later, fully determined to gain his revenge on the country which had been responsible for humiliating him. The story of the Battle of Warsaw is an incredible one, and we invite everyone watching at home to find out more about the extraordinary things that the leaders of Poland, this free country, had to do in order to restore freedom uh, for Europe. And we remind everybody that the fate of Europe and the fate of the world would have been very, very different if it wasn't for those difficult decisions taken in those few days that could have changed the course of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite you to give Mr. Jan Shumsky a round of applause for guiding us through this story. Thank you very much, Jan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to uh, take you through this experience as well, and I'd now like to invite to the stage Mr. Mark Gallagher. Welcome, Mark. Mark is a renowned Formula One egghead, as we say in English. There's nothing he doesn't know about the sport, having been intimately involved in it since 1983. I hope you won't hold that against me, Mark. <laughs> Mark is a businessman. Uh, he's a commentator, a pundit of, of some note. He's an investor. Uh, he's an author. And frankly speaking, if I read to you his biography, it would take most of the rest of this session, so I won't do that. I'll invite Mark to speak to the stage. Come to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Dobry uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Great pleasure to be here. Patrick, thank you very much for that kind introduction and what a fascinating presentation uh, for Mika and I uh, to be able to listen to um, on this, uh, the first of this 100 by uh, 100 uh, events. And thank you to the organizers for inviting us here to uh, Warsaw today. Uh, very nice to see you all. Uh, can I ask for a show of hands in the room? Uh, how many Formula One fans do we have in the room? Can I have a show of hands? Any Formula One fans? Oh, great. Okay, well, you should all really enjoy this presentation. Uh, for the rest of you, this might be quite long. Okay? We'll try and keep it interesting. Um, it's very enjoyable to come to Warsaw, especially on a day like today, uh, in beautiful weather, to have the privilege of meeting uh, Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki, to have the chance to talk about Poland's history, but also to talk about the future. And really, Mika and I are going to talk to you this evening, of course, about his career. And for those of you who are big Formula One fans, and there are a few, um, we're going to take some questions from you later. So uh, if you've ever wanted to ask a Formula One world champion uh, any questions, this will be your opportunity tonight. We're going to talk about a few topics, uh, not surprisingly following the presentation we've just had. We're going to talk about what it takes to be a winner. Uh, we're going to talk about how to make difficult decisions under pressure, how to take those calculated risks that are the difference between winning and losing in life, in business, in sport, and even for countries. So, without further ado, I'm going to uh, welcome someone on stage who um, I first met uh, back in 1988. So, it's uh, 30 years ago that I met this guy. Uh, at that time, he was 19 years of age, uh, just beginning his career in race car driving, uh, not long out of go-kart racing. Um, we met then, and then I watched as he went on to achieve incredible success within the environment of Formula One. Of course, winning the World Championship on two occasions, 1998 and 1999, driving for the McLaren Mercedes team. He won 20 Grand Prix victories during his career. He was on the podium 51 times. He must have a very big trophy cabinet somewhere. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, if you could welcome on stage Mr. Mika Hakkinen.
Thank you, Mark. Thank you. You're right, actually. It's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a many years ago when we met the first time. And, and uh, I did retire from La 1 2001, which is also quite a few years ago. <laughs> and when I saw these pictures, we had color pictures. It wasn't black and white, you know, so, yeah, yeah. so it's yeah, not that long time ago, you know. <laughs> now tell me, how has your day today been in, in Warsaw? It's been quite a long day. We flew in this morning. We had a very busy afternoon. Tell us about your meeting with uh, the Prime Minister. Very interesting. The, the, the whole day has been really, really interesting. And, and the whole this concept, the whole this campaign, I, I found fascinating and, and I can I can see what's been happening today. It is a success, and it's going to be a success. And and uh, and had you been to Poland before? I think you had a couple of times. Yeah, a few times. I, I visited yep. before. Uh, but when when I was here in in previous times, it, it it was not so intensive, concentrating about the history of the Poland. Uh, so so now it has been an incredible experience for me. Uh, uh, the hearing, hearing all the stories and, and the real, you know, the people who had really professional, really studied that. Also hearing from the Prime Minister telling stories about uh, the Poland and the history and, and uh, it's great to see he's a good, good leader. Now let's talk, um, obviously we've heard a lot today about the history of Poland. One of the, the topics that uh, they've been talking about in the previous two uh, uh, speakers were, were talking about was making, making decisions under pressure. Um, as a Formula One world champion, you experienced lots of moments of pressure during your career. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you learned how to do or did it come naturally to, is it you're in your Finnish mentality to cope with pressure? How did you cope with the pressure during your career? Yes, it, it, it is a long journey. It's a really long learning curve, how you are able to handle that. And, and uh, my career started already when I was five years old, when I started doing go-karting and racing. And, and uh, when I did that go-karting racing, during a, during a season of, of karting, I had minimum 200 racing starts. And, and, and that means when you are age you know, 10 years old, yes, you're doing about 200 racing starts. You had about 40 girls and boys behind you on a racing, racing track on the grid. And, and you had to make these decisions about how you will perform, how you concentrate, how you maximize your performance on a racetrack. So, so it's a long, long journey what you do, developing your concentration and, and your determination of winning. And, and of course, yes, Formula One is the pinnacle. Uh, why this is a pinnacle? Because when you are, when you're doing a go-karting, yes, you have your parents uh, who is taking care of your go-kart. But you know, in Formula One, you're talking about team like a McLaren these days. You have about 4,000 people in a team who is your family, basically. So you have to communicate all the time with this big organization. So it requires much more focus, uh, much more uh, concentration to able the performance, uh, to do the performance. And of course, the pressure is much higher. Now, I've got to ask you a question. Is it true that the first time you raced a go-kart when you were five, that you crashed on the first lap? Is that true? Is that a true story? <laughs> it, it is, actually. It <laughs> is. And, and it's, Mark, it, it's really important. Uh, well, it's not important to crash, of course, but... <laughs> well, we all learn from our mistakes, <laughs> yeah. huh? We learn from our mistakes every time, yeah? Yeah, and, and, uh, and uh, th that, that what happened. I was about five years old, and, and very first time when, when I went to the race course, you know, and, and I, I was leaving from the pit lane to go to the very first corner. I, I was going too close inside on a, on a, on a corner in a curve, and... and uh, the go-kart just went clipped upside down. You went upside down? Upside down, okay. you know, and, and you, can, you can imagine t t people who have the kids, you know, how, you know, my parents were feeling, you know, I was a young kid under the go-kart and, and you can see the parents running there, oh my God, my little, little son, you know, and, and uh, 
Well, uh, nothing serious happened. I was able to climb out of the, the go kart, and and I, I saw the picture of the you know I saw the faces of my parents, and I immediately recognized you know that you know how worried they looked, and and I, I immediately got lesson straight away that time that way, you know. Pay attention, you know, when when you taking taking your risks going around the corner, uh, you know, you can you can be very close. But don't touch, you know. So calculate. Think before you go in the corner. Think what you do, and and that that little accident when I was five years old, educate me immediately. That way, you know, go flat out, go maximum what you can go, but leave the little margin, you know. Now, you've just introduced the subject of risk, okay? And we talk about your first accident mm -hmm. in that cart when you were five years of age, um, are, are you a risk taker or are you a risk pre preventer? I mean, do you, do you like to race when you have complete confidence about the outcome or are you, are you willing to accept a certain level of risk? Yes, I mean, <laughs> in Formula One, uh, when, when you are driving, if you do just a testing, you are not doing a race, you're just doing a testing. You are you are taking very calculated risks all the time, every corner. But but in your mind, you you have all the time understanding that way. If something goes something goes wrong, you are able to manage that way. You don't get hurt. Mm. Uh, but then when you're on a race weekend itself, you know then the risk, what you're taking risks, that level goes higher. And, and when you have the qualification example, the time trial, when you are competing to get the best possible lap time for the starting position for the race, that is the lap when you are do taking risks nearly every corner. So when you are entering the corner, you, you know that way the car is absolutely on a limit. You are on a limit of your capabilities of driving and your talent. So you you taking risks. Uh, and, but without those risks, you, you cannot reach your goal. Yeah, sure. You have to take those risks. Now but not all the time. Like I said, only for certain moments. So you talked about the fact that in, in karting, you're maybe doing 200 starts a year. So by the time you are 10 years in karting, you've done like 2,000 <laughs> 2, uh, starts. So you, you're really training yourself. You're training mm -hmm. and you're practicing for when you get into professional racing. Yeah. I mean, when I met you, you were racing in, uh, Mika was racing in a series called uh, Opel Lotus, uh, General Motors uh, back series uh, at that time in Europe. And then you went to Formula 3, and you had quite a difficult first year with Formula 3. And then the second year, you won the British Championship. And suddenly, Mika Hakkinen was really, you know, you were going places. I love it. You love it. <laughs> But you were still a teenager. Yeah, that's true. I mean, did, did you realize as a teenager that your career was now going in the right direction? Or was it just a question of one step at a time? Just take it simple steps. Uh, yes and no. I mean, uh, like you mentioned, yes. I, I did Opel Lotus in 1988. I won the European Championship, so automatically it was time to move to higher next category, which was called Formula 3. And, and, uh, and, and it was the moment to choose which team I'm going in. And, 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 I did, and we did the decision uh, to go a team which never has been running Formula 3 team before. So of course it was a mistake. <laughs> so, so. Uh, and the thing so is, it was a team of nice guys. They were nice guys. Oh, absolutely. But they uh, just didn't have the experience. Exactly. So. Uh, and I think that that's kind of a little bit of a lesson. You know, if you if you go if you're going to try and achieve something, you need to work with the right group of people. You need the experience. You need the experts around you. And as a young driver, there was no way that you could fix all the engineering on that car. So the team was nowhere, and it was it was a disappointment. Yeah, absolutely. And and the, 
but again, you know, it is a journey when you are facing uh, problems, you are making mistakes, but those mistakes cannot put you down. It cannot put you down like, okay, I give up, I go back to Finland. <laughs> <laughs> no, you cannot, you cannot do that. You, you have to analyze your moments and, and, uh, and uh, analyze it exactly what, what are the cause of the mistakes, what's been happening. And, and uh, well, t the following year, I moved to, I was still in the same category, but moving a team who had the great knowledge, uh, much, much more experienced people. And, and it was a great success. So, so winning the uh, following year uh, uh, in F3, I was more or less ready to move to Formula One. Now, you just mentioned something important there, which is, when you won the Formula 3 championship, you were now driving for a competitive team. Uh, now, I don't want to go into too much detail of all the, the lower categories of racing, but that Formula 3 team was run by a guy from New Zealand called Dick Bennett. And within our industry, he is super famous. I mean, he's he was just a top engineer. He knew how to win. Uh, of course, Ayrton Senna from Brazil, had driven for Dick a few, you know, a few years before. So having the right people is really important. Who would, you, obviously you've got Dick, who, who else other than Dick Bennett's would you say was really important to your career at that time? I mean, who were the people around you who were kind of helping to guide you towards Formula One? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because uh, obviously through that long journey, you have you are involved with enormous amount of people, and it, it everybody who I met, uh, it, it was never a situation that way. It would have been, it, it was a mistake in my career. I look all these moments, meetings, the people who who, who I was m meeting through my my career. I learned something from them, and and uh, but yes, for sure there was a people on the way who really influenced my, my, my career uh, more than others. And of course, Keke Rosberg was one of them who was influencing a lot in my career. When uh, did you meet Keke Rosberg? Th that, that was year 80, 87, 88. Okay. Yeah. So, so just when you had gone into cars. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And for those of you who are not Formula One fans, Keke Rosberg was Formula One world champion and uh, for the Williams, uh, team and of course a, a super famous guy in Formula One in the 1980s. So really, you 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 got some advice, some mentoring from pretty key guys. Oh yeah, I, I have I had plenty of plenty of people, met the professors in, in back in Finland, who who studied the people's mind, the psychological side, uh, spending a lot of lot of time with him. Uh, he was writing a book, trying to understand the young racing driver, how he operates, how he thinks. Uh, so I was learning a lot from him. Uh, James Hunt uh, uh, was one of the mentors who I met many, many times, uh, discussing about how he see how the Formula One is, and how I should, what kind of attitude I should take when you are, when I'm in the Formula One. Because when I was a, when I arrived to Formula One. I was really serious guy, of course, you know, serious guy, you know, because I went there to win. And when I did join the Formula One, I wasn't winning, I was losing. So it doesn't make you so happy. Yeah, and sure. <laughs> so I, I needed the team, the advisors who I had, they said, okay, talk to these people who've been there, who has winning a world championship who's been losing and winning, and talk to these guys. See if you found different angle in your personal career. And, and again, when I was a young guy and talking with these people, sometimes it was really frustrating to, to hear their advices because I was, I was a little bit too, how would I say, focusing too much. I was too much focusing for the racing. I didn't see what's happening outside of racing, so I was maybe too tense. So That's that why James Hunt, every time when I met the James Hunt, you know, when I was leaving from his home, said, Mika, 
Remember to have fun. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, fun. Yeah, this is now, really fun, you know. Now, ja <laughs> again, for those of you who don't follow Formula One maybe very closely, so James Hunt uh, was a British Formula One world champion in the 1970s. Uh, there was a very famous movie about four years ago called Rush, which some of you may have seen, which uh, told the story of his duel with uh, Nicky Lauda. And James was famous for being a playboy, but actually he was a very interesting character because mm. he knew how to have fun, but he also was so competitive as an individual. And I think that's where he was an, an interesting coach for you. De definitely. I mean, I mean uh, it, it was really fascinating, really fascinating to see see his point of view about the motor racing and, and yeah, like you said, really important part of my career, definitely. I learned a lot. Even, even little single bit things, you know, can make a difference. It don't have to be a massive amount of information. You can pick up a little bit of information from there, there, put them together, which fits your character and your, your way of working. Now, you, um, you finally arrived in Formula One racing in 1991, United States Grand Prix, Phoenix, Arizona, driving for the Lotus team. And, and you spent a couple of years with Lotus. Lotus was a sm small team. They mm. were struggling financially. So it wasn't a very easy team for you to work in at the beginning. But it was a small team, so maybe not so much pressure. Is that correct or, or not? Well. When you, when you enter into Formula One and, and you are in a position of driving a car, there's always a pressure. doesn't matter are you in a big team or a smaller team. Uh, what brought me the pressure when I was in, uh, in a Team Lotus, when I started Formula One, we didn't get any results. So because we didn't have no budget, we weren't able to do testing. Like all the bigger teams, they were doing a lot of testing, developing the car, the drivers got more experience, so we didn't do any testing. So when you don't get results, it brings you certain pressure. And, and uh, it's difficult to turn that to be positive pressure. <laughs> but it's, again, w what I did learn over my time in Team Lotus, this communication element is one of the key points. And the Finns, in, 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 you know, I think we, we don't talk so much. It's unusual, actually, I talk so much. Uh, but uh, when, when we are in the racetracks, you know, with Finns, we, we don't, we are not maybe talking too much, but we want the results to talk. But I, I think that was, that was um, one of the most challenging things, was the communication. Uh, probably there was also the language barrier, you know, the, which was influencing a little bit. Uh, but yeah, communication. You know, more you communicate, the better result you get, you know, and more understanding what's happening. I think it's, it's interesting uh, listening to Patrick's uh, presentation earlier on. You know, a, a Formula One race weekend is like, it's like a, it's a battle between racing teams. And every morning and every evening, the team will have a meeting to discuss the strategy and how, the, how things are going. We are constantly looking at our performance. So that's one of the ways why we, how we try to make the right decisions. We talk to each other, we look, out, we look at how we are doing. We are very realistic. A lot of honesty is required in those meetings. I mean, mm -hmm. so, some of the meetings in Formula One, I think it's, from a human point of view, it can be difficult because y you have to be completely honest about your mistakes. Mm -hmm. As a driver, the, the data is there to, to show you <laughs> how you're doing, yeah? Uh, but the engineers and the mechanics and, the, and everyone is in that room to get all of the key people in that room. You need to have complete trust in each other and you need to have that great communication that you talked about. It's very important indeed, you know, and, and it's, it's quite a challenging when, when you are in a debriefing, meeting with, with your, your data engineer, your engineer, and opposite of the table, you have your teammate, who is your one of the toughest competitor out there. And he is with his data engineer, engineer, uh, chief mechanic is in the room. So we're all discussing about the situation, 
where we are at the moment, what we need to improve, how we can be better. And, and uh, trust is very important indeed. Uh, but you know, when the opposite of the table is your teammate, who is your toughest competitor, do you want to say everything? You want to tell everything? Uh, actually, yes. Because the reality is, you know, the data is so important part of the motor racing. You know, we are collecting I mean, these days, you know, it's a massive data. Yeah, we collect about 80, 80 gigabytes of data from a two-car team on a race weekend. So quite a lot of data so coming in. Um, let me move on to the kind of the next. I want to cover a few key points in your career for, for people to think about. And then we can, we can think about some questions from the audience as well. Um, Sorry to be in a pack all the time. <laughs> <that direction. laughs> um, so you drove for Lotus. You then joined the McLaren team as a test driver, and you were then promoted to becoming a race driver for McLaren. Uh, it was the Portuguese Grand Prix. Your teammate was Ayrton Senna. Hopefully some of you have heard of Ayrton Senna, so he's a pretty legendary name in the world of Formula One. And, um, and you out-qualified him at your first weekend in Portugal. I mean, talk a little bit about that weekend but talk maybe a little bit more about, about Ayrton, about working with Ayrton as a test driver uh, for him and then joining him as a teammate, because that was an exceptional experience for, for you at that stage in your career. Yeah, in, indeed. So I, I become a race driver with McLaren in 93, and my teammate was Ayrton Senna, three times world champion. Uh, and and uh, of course, when I joined the team and going to Portugal Grand Prix next to him, I was full of confidence that, well, of course, I'm going to win here. And, <laughs> and, and uh, it, it was fascinating to see Ayrton working. And, and the way he was, again, now coming back to this communication, how he was communicating with the people, how he was taking the whole team to support him to get the success. Uh, so it, it really opened my eyes that weekend that way, Mika, hey, you don't know nothing. You know, you have a long journey to come to the same level where it is. Arto Senna is three times world champion. Nevertheless, you know, when the time trial came, the qualification, I was quicker than him, so it was, a, it was quite a massive shock for him. For me, it was normal, but in, in terms of Formula One world, th this this news that where I was quicker than him was not, it was definitely not normal. But fascinating to see his way of working and, and, and uh, what, what he was really capable to do is really working on tiny details to understanding how he can be quicker. It sounds quite a big picture basically, but uh, like one racetrack can be five kilometers long. Uh, and, and, but one corner can make a really massive difference. And he was really able to work in details, and that's what his quality. So, so a young driver like I was that time, it, it was not so easy to learn to do what he did. So it took years to come to the same level. Did, you mentioned an interesting thing about Ayrton Senna, was that the, the whole of the McLaren team were focused on on helping him because he was a leader, he was a team leader. Yeah. And I think you learned a lot about the importance of becoming the team leader because a few years later you were t effectively team leader at McLaren uh, yourself. So you realized how important it is. You know, in Formula One, I think a lot of people see the driver, mm -hmm. they, they think of him and being on his own. Obviously, the driver has 100 people in the team at the race. Today in Formula One, you have maybe eight or 900 people back at the factory. So actually, you really need to be part, you need to have the ability to lead a group of people and to inspire them. You know, they've, they've, got, to, yeah. they've got to design you the best car, they've got to develop it, they've got to make it reliable, high quality. You know, they have to give you all the support you need to go out and stand a chance to win a race. Yeah, the difference what in my career and Arto Senna's career was, that way when Arto Senna did arrive to McLaren, he had a winning car. 
So I, in the very first year, if I remember correctly, 1988, uh, they they won nearly all the Grand Prix. 15 of the 16. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. he did jump in a beautiful situation, and he finished second in that year, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, so, so automatically the team was looking like, wow, this great guy, you know, he's a fantastic driver. Uh, so nevertheless, fantastic driver, he did a great, great work and, and great, great uh, challenges. Uh, when I did arrive to Team McLaren, we were basically going a little bit like this. We did not have any more the maximum support anymore from the great engine manufacturer. We were looking for different engine packages all the time to get our car to perform as best as possible. So to be in a position to lead the team when the things are not going right, it was very difficult. Yeah. I never won a Grand Prix in my life. Never been a pole position, never been, of course, never been a world champion. And the team is going a little bit like this, looking for the right package at the moment. So how to lead these people in a team? So only solution, what I found it out at that time was just, you know, be a positive guy. You know, again, keep analyzing what mistakes we are doing and, and to be honest with yourself, of course but to be positive and work hard, you know, never give up. And, and it was incredible uh, how long time it took until we did finally get the package that way we can win races. So, you know. Well, I think the, the fact that it, it took seven years from your career started in Formula One until you won your first Grand Prix, I mean, seven years of hard work the McLaren team was, was on the downward cycle for a while, then they finally came good. So it was, a, it was a, a long road to get to that first victory, but then you finally made the breakthrough. Before we talk about that, I just want to finish on, on Ayrton Senna, because we talked earlier on about the risk of Formula One. The year after you were a teammate to Ayrton, he, he was killed at the San Marino Grand Prix Mm -hmm. on May the 1st, uh, 1994. Uh, the day before, uh, Roland Ratzenberger from Austria was killed. Uh, so we had two fatalities in one weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was really a, a really key point in the history of Formula One. Um, one year later, 1995, you then have a 300 kilometer per hour accident in Australia, yeah. in Adelaide. Um, any of you who go on YouTube, if you go on YouTube and you put in Mika Hacken in, you know, Australia Grand Prix 1995 accident, you will see the violence of the accident, a really heavy impact. Mm. And actually, when you, I'm sure you don't watch it ever, but I, I looked at it on YouTube yesterday. I mean, the violence of the accident is extraordinary. Yeah your head is just bouncing around in the cockpit. And you suffered very, very serious injuries. Actu actually, you suffered life-threatening mm. uh, injuries. You were taken to hospital. I remember everybody in Formula One was expecting to hear really negative news because it, it looked so serious. Talk us through that. First, first of all, what do you remember of that accident? I mean, 300 kilometers per hour, everything's happening pretty fast. Yeah, yeah you're right, you're right. But anyway, it, it was uh, it was the last Grand Prix of the of the season, so I think you know the, all the teams they're quite exhausted, you know, long season. And this the accident that happened to me on Sunday morning it was just bad news. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, I had a I had a situation with the car when when the rear tire basically exploded, and and the, me to going in the corner, it was impossible to turn normally because basically the, the rear tire have inflated. So I hit the wall and, and, uh, and uh, it, it, like you mentioned, it was a pretty bad one. Luckily in that corner there was a medical, medical team were in that corner, so they were immediately there helping me. Uh, hospital was only five minutes away, so there was a lot of luck also in that time. So. 
obviously the thing when the impact happened, uh, there's maybe tiny, tiny things what I remember. But certainly then, a couple of days later when I woke up in a hospital, it, it, everything, you know, people who are meeting there and seeing there, it, it was, a, it was, a, it was quite, a, quite a shock. Uh, I mean, you suffered a very serious head injury. Yeah, I cracked my skull, so it was definitely serious. And, and the, the most terrifying was basically when I was in the hospital, when you see the people when they come in to see you, because they are terrified. Yeah. They, yeah. Got, they cannot keep <laughs> the, you know, they are shocked. And, and uh, uh, also in that time, I was in, in position in my career, it was really going in a good, good direction all the time and suddenly pff, looks like everything is over. So uh, what, what I recognize that and why I'm here today and why I got all the success was definitely that way I had a, I had a great family. I had a great uh, management team taking care of me. A uh, great team, McLaren, who was really uh, 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 supporting, of course, but also giving me certain security, not putting me under pressure that way. Come on, Mika, when you wake up tomorrow, tomorrow morning, are you going to race with us? So they gave me the time to really to recover uh, properly. And also, of course, my, my girlfriend at that time was giving me a great support. Uh, so so uh, it was quite a journey to come, come to the, today to wake up in the morning. I said, OK, now I have to make a decision. Do I want to go back to racing? And, and certainly, uh, it was not easy because when, when you have an injury like I had, the doctors doesn't tell you, doctors doesn't tell you, let's say, uh, that way one month after the accident you can start doing exercise, you can start running. No, you have to take, you know, three months you have to stay calm and, and not to do anything too, too heavy exercise. So, so the day when I make a decision to come back to motor racing, I have only about two months to make my training program to come to racing. So the recovery and everything was really, really complicated. But... Uh, Do you think the accident changed you? It, it definitely changed me, certainly. Uh, in way of that way, I, I had a time to really to look what is important in my life. Okay. So motor racing is just little part of your life. It's your hobby, it's your job. Uh, but, 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 but Miki, you didn't become slower. <laughs> no. You know, no. You, you, I, in fact, if anything, you became even faster. I mean, you, you won your two world championships three years later, yeah. three and four years later. So it's not, you didn't back off. You, no. still, what you were still going, as, as your favorite expression, flat out, you know? Yeah, you, definitely. You still went flat out. I started working even harder, you know, I started working even harder with my physical condition, uh, communicating pe pe with the people even more, uh, because I, I, I did, I did, I loved my life, and I realized how wonderful the life is, but I knew that way I have something in the future, the goal to catch, I want to be world champion. And, and uh, also, I th of course, the, the accident, what it gave me, it gave me even more confidence to support what I have from the team, from the family, uh, from the management. That way I, I got the even more power to show them that way, yes, I can do it. Now, you, so two years after that accident, you won your very first uh, Grand Prix, European Grand Prix in Jerez in Spain, yep. 1997. Uh, quite a, a famous race in Formula One history. And then in 1998, 1999, you won two consecutive world championship titles. Mika Hakkinen became the man in Formula One. And you had a, you had a rival. You had a, a kind of arch rival. He was a guy who you first raced, I think, in... I think I'm right in saying you first raced him in Formula Three. Uh, I know Michael Schumacher and you had, a, you had a small crash in Formula Three together in Macau in China one year, but Michael Schumacher became your, uh, not enemy, but I'm, I'm talking about professional uh, rival. Uh, how do you look back on that competitive fight 
Mika Hakkinen in the McLaren, Michael Schumacher in the Ferrari team. Yeah, everything, everything really started actually in 84 already with Michael. Oh, okay. And, and, uh, and he, was, he, was, he was really a racing driver who, was, of course, he was a confidence. All of us, you know, we young drivers, we were confident. But, but uh, I, was, I was sure I was going to be a world champion. And I, I was sure I'm the best driver in the whole world. And he looked at, you know, he was thinking exactly the same. I'm the best. And we didn't have to say anything, you know. And, and so it, it was, was just unspoken. You, you, just, yeah. you, were, you uh, knew that he wanted to do what yeah, you wanted. Exactly. Okay. And, and uh, we did, you know, when you are a mount of racing drivers, it's easy to see their weaknesses. What are their weaknesses uh, outside of the racing car or in the racing car? But Michael was doing a lot of right things. <laughs> so it was difficult to find any better angle, how I can beat him, how I can be better than him. And, and, uh, and it, was a, it was a big, big challenge. And, and uh, I, I had a couple of races already 94, uh, 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 sorry, 84 already, <laughs> that's a long time ago, oh my God. And, and uh, when, when we won the European Championship uh, team race, in the go-karts and, and we, we beat the Germany and Michael was one of the drivers so he wasn't very happy about that already <laughs> then. Then in the Formula 3 we raced in 1990. I just took one part of the only just the one race in German championship and I won that. He was second. Again he was not very happy chap. Uh, <laughs> so there was a something personal a little bit. You know I was perfectly in my opinion right place right time but for him definitely not. So, so it was like a, all the time, little, little battle, uh, all the way, all the way in, in Formula One. Yeah. So, so um, as I mentioned, you won that world championship twice, '98 and '99. When you started winning Grand Prix, and when you started to see the world championship coming towards you, did you did you do anything differently, or was it again just? part of that progression? Was it just a natural thing? The team, the team had a competitive car, mm -hmm. you were a competitive driver, you had the right support. Talk to us about that 98 season and winning your first title. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because uh, when, when you're in a position with the racing car, you are not winning. What's happening? You try everything. You try to enter the car from that side or this side and you, know, you try different uh, training methods with your body to be better racing driver. You try everything. You try to sleep 10 hours, 12 hours, 5 hours. You try everything, how I can be better. And you work very hard with the team. And, and uh, yes, 97, I won my first Grand Prix. And of course I was happy. But I was thinking, this is it? It wasn't so difficult. You know, <laughs> seven years I've been trying this and here so, I am. So literally you're thinking it's no big deal. Yeah, it's not a big deal. <laughs> and, and then comes the year 98 and, and the, this trend continues. So I keep winning, winning Grand Prix. And uh, it, everything went more simple. You know, I, I think me to looking for that day when I went to Grand Prix, I was focusing such a many different areas but not really focusing the most important, which is what I do best, driving a racing car. So when you are in a position when you are not winning, you keep, sometimes you are an engineer, sometimes you are aerodynamic specialist, uh, sometimes you are studying tires, you're studying the fuel, the oils, you do everything, you, you all the time constantly study to be better racing driver, to collect more and more knowledge. The moment when you are winning, you realize that way, hold on a second, focus, now better to focus what you do best, which is driving. So you can put all your energies to get the result of, of driving. But all that process is, is a great journey altogether. 
So, I mean, there's, a, there's an interesting lesson there about if you want to be the best at something, you really have to focus on what it is that you're good at and, yes. and deliver the results from yes. that. <laughs> now, um, let's just, um, let's kind of fast forward because you, you repeated the World Championship success in 1999. And the really surprising thing, I think, for those of us who worked in Formula One, competing, my team was competing against you, you know, we were, you were just a top guy, and, it, and then you retired from Formula One at the end of 2001. You were only 33 years of age when you retired. A lot of people in Formula One, they stay maybe too long, they stay to 38 years of age mm. or 37. But a lot of people, we, we felt, wow, Mika has gone quite early. Why did you stop? you know, quite soon after you won the world championship the second time? Yeah, I mean, certainly my accident influenced my decision to retire. Uh, and, and... Is that, sorry to interrupt, but is that because you didn't want to repeat it? Yes. Um, uh, in, in, yeah, winning world championship 98, 99, I was like, yeah, this is it. This is fantastic. Uh, and, and the year 2000, quite a few mechanical failures with the car and in a very high speed indeed. Uh, 2001, same story, you know, again, mechanical failures, quite a big accident. And accidents that way I thought, when I see the barrier coming, I said, that's it, I could have, I could have died. Uh, so, so that's interesting. So, so the risk aspect kind of returned a little bit because yeah. Because the car kept breaking. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that influenced my decision that way, Mika, don't push your luck. You know, you, you had bad accident. You came to, to, you are doing this motor racing sport because you wanted to be a world champion in Formula One. So I did it. So don't push your luck more, you know. And, and uh, I think that, that, that was the one of the reasons why 2001, I decided to, to retire. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention someone else who is a uh, Formula One driver. He also happens to be 33 years of age, which was the age that you uh, retired at. Uh, Robert Kubica from uh, Krakow. Um, of course, Poland's first Formula One uh, driver. He joined the BMW Sauber team in 2006. Um, he had an extraordinary accident at the 2007 Canadian Grand Prix, one of the most infamous accidents in Formula, one of the most serious accidents mm. we saw, and he, he survived that. And then he won the Canadian Grand Prix there the following year. And I think most people in the room are familiar with uh, Robert Kubica, fan fantastic talent. Um, we also know what happened to him. I mean, he had a superb career going 2011, he had a terrible accident in the rally car. Actually, it turns out he had a contract to drive for Ferrari in Formula One for mm. 2012. Um, and now, while we are standing here mm. at this 100 by 100 event, uh, thanks to the uh, Polish National Foundation, we, we might be on the verge of seeing Robert Kubica come back to Formula One. I looked just before we came on stage, mm. a lot of the media are talking about that because even with his injury, um, it looks like there is the opportunity, no problem for him to drive this Williams Formula One car, maybe to come back. I mean, just talk a little bit about Robert um, and, and what your feeling is about the opportunity that he has maybe to come back in Formula One. Is it, is it the right thing for him to do or is it the wrong thing? I would, I would personally love to see him back. I think, it's a, I think he would be a great example for the young people uh, who has injuries, or older people who has injuries. It doesn't mean you have to stay back home, sitting on the sofa and start crying, you know. It, you better move on in your life and, and to, to challenge yourself. And, and uh, the Formula One is a great, great uh, sport, in one sense, because the car is tailor-made for you. So even you have an injury, you can still design exactly the shape of the steering wheel you want, the gear shift levers, the clutch levers, buttons, whatever you have, you can tailor-made for you. So he has all the possibilities, all the 
mechanical and mechanics and everything possible with the designers to the car exactly for him. Uh, I'm sure in Formula One you can negotiate with the per special permission. That way you could have some help in the, in the car that uh, helping his injury. Yeah. So I, I think it's a, I think it would be great he would come back to Formula One uh, and and to challenge the other other drivers and show his talent and his performance what he can do and and for sure for Poland it would be great for the younger people to to, to get motivation you know. You know when uh, I, I don't know if you all realize but when Robert Kubica was racing in Formula One. Um, the Hungarian Grand Prix basically became the Polish Grand Prix. It was just, <laughs> it was just full of, we had like 50,000 Polish fans would turn up with the flag. It was just incredible to see the national support that Robert was taking with him. Hungary particularly, also Grand Prix in Germany and play, everywhere we turned up there was the kind of this crazy fan base that Robert had built up and it, it was wonderful to see. And it's actually been a really, a tragedy for Robert that his career halted in 2011 because of that accident. Actually, it was a tragedy for Formula One because we had made a big impact here in Poland. We had a lot mm. of media uh, coverage and that kind of thing. Um, we're going to call our conversation to a halt. Um, we're, it's time really for us to take some questions uh, from you. Now, the, the important thing about questions from the audience is that everyone is always too shy, okay? Uh, so normally there's like a complete silence to begin with. So here's the story, okay? Anything you say will be private, okay? We just keep it in this room between us <laughs> and, of course, on the internet, okay? <laughs> so it's just a private conversation between us and the whole of the world who are watching on Twitter and Periscope and, and anywhere else. So there's one gentleman at the back. Has already, you've already got a question. Oh, go, cool. go, go cool. for it. And I, I will, uh, by the way, I will yeah. repeat the question for um, the Polish. audience. Yeah, so go ahead. Fantastic question. So, it, oh, oh, part two. Sorry, <laughs> two, two part question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so the question, two part question, if you had one racing car and one racing track, which would it be? And don't forget, Ron Dennis is maybe listening. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. you have one car and one race track. Um, and then the second question is, second part of the question is, who would be quicker, Mika Hakkinen or Robert Kubica? Uh, yeah, I think I think we know the answer to this yeah. might be coming. So anyway, I I think it would be I I think it would be great uh, to drive the current uh, for one car uh, to go to track like uh, Spa in Belgium, great circuit indeed, or go to Japan in Suzuka. And I, I would think the the the, the car from Valtteri Bottas or Lewis Hamilton. I think the driving Mercedes, you know. Could be really fascinating. Or Kimi Raikkonen, you know, or or Sebastian. It, it would be great to great to drive this car, and and uh, because because development has gone really far compared to time when I was racing. There's a lot of new technology. The tires has a lot of grip, a lot of time force, a yeah. lot of power in the engine. So it could be fascinating. I mean, l last last weekend in. Um No, no, I prefer the cars today. <laughs> <laughs> but again, the, about, the, about the Robert, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, he's a different generation. He's a different generation. I have to be so many Polish people. I have to be careful what I'm going to say. Yeah, are, are you chickening out of that question? <laughs> Is he, anyway, the Mika Hakkinen fans will say Mika, and the Robert Kubica fans will say Robert. So it's very simple. It's uh, no, no discussion. OK, another question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, very important for us. Uh, this is a great idea to combine it. Uh, my question is, how do you think? Uh, what was your the main advantage over the other drivers, other racers? Because there are different opinions. Uh, because you are sliding a little bit, yeah. Uh, that this was the best, uh, what you could do, and this give you a 
So what, what gave you the winning advantage over other drivers? What, what was it that you were doing? Okay, uh, when, you, when you're talking about driving a racing car, it's, well, I'm going to say it's pretty simple. But at the end of the day, you know, you have a long straight, you have a corner, and you have a straight again. Well, it's not too difficult. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if we're talking about just the one single corner, and how you can be better than other driver, you know, that one single corner. So what do you have to do? You have to brake a little bit later. You have to carry a little bit more speed in a corner. You have to accelerate a little bit earlier. And everything happens in a, such a short time. You know, we are talking about you can be better than other driver, one corner maybe less than a tenth maybe one or less than a tenth, and that's a ridiculously small time. So where is this coming from? So, <laughs> I don't know. But, you, but, <laughs> I, but actually, the way you're describing it, I mean, this is, this, this is the typical mind of a, a racing driver. So you don't look at the whole lap. You break it down into small parts, and then you, you perfect each part. And we, and we talk, in Formula One, we talk about putting a lap together. Yeah. So putting a lap together is about taking all the little bits and doing each of them perfectly so that you get the optimal, optimal performance. And it, it's like anything in business or, or in life. Um, it's, you know, you want the big result, but the big result only comes from putting all the small things together in order to, to achieve that. Now, any questions from the... From the main floor? Yes. Oh, from Robert. Right, good. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is the big question. I'm so pleased Robert's asked this question because um, actually we, we, we cheated a little bit. We talked about this. Uh, yeah, sure. And, and I know this is. So this is your famous overtaking maneuver on Michael Schumacher. Um, at the Belgian Grand Prix mm -hmm. in 2000. And um, I mean, I, I will let you tell the story of what happened, but just for those of you who are not familiar with, with the overtake, uh, which is incidentally one of probably the most famous overtake in modern uh, history in Formula One, um, Mika was in second place in the race behind Michael Schumacher's Ferrari. Uh, the Spa Francorchamps circuit is very fast, it's very demanding. Schumacher's a tough guy. Uh, to overtake. Um, they went through one of the most challenging corners in Formula One together, f absolutely flat out. And when they came up onto the straight, there was a slow car in front. It was uh, driven by a Brazilian driver called Ricardo Zonta. And Michael Schumacher thought he would do something a little bit clever on Mika, which was he would, he would pull out behind Zonta and Mika would have to, to slow down or brake but he didn't know what he was dealing with, okay? Because Mika did not slow down. He simply went the other side of Ricardo Zonta. So this guy from Brazil, Ricardo Zonta, had Michael Schumacher go past on one side, doing 320 kilometers per hour, but Mika Hakkinen go past on the other side, doing, I don't know, 325 kilometers per hour, and you overtook Michael, and you won that race. And I mean, I remember we watched it, and yeah. we just thought it was completely, like, how do you make a split-second decision to do that? And yeah. you won the race. But th when I asked you about this, you told me there was a little bit more to the story. It wasn't just about that lap. It w during the race... Yeah, it, it, was a, it was a long preparation. Well, when that overtaking situation happened, of course, I was lucky. I didn't plan that the driver to be on the middle of the track, you know, just a few laps before the end of the race. Uh, but, you know, I, I did try to overtake Michael many times, only one place on the track, because that, that was the only place where I was able to overtake Michael Schumacher. And, and the Spa racetrack, I think it's one of the longest racetracks, I think seven kilometers long, massively long. So only one place I can overtake him. And there was a less and less laps left on a race, you know. So every time I tried to overtake him, 
he was really closing the door when we were going 320 kilometers per hour, you know, nearly touching. He put him Cl on the closing, cross. Closing the door is, yeah. a ver is a very nice expression yeah. for nearly putting you off the track, yeah? Yeah, okay. exactly. So <laughs> he, he was very nasty in that. So I was really putting massive effort. I couldn't overtake him. Doesn't matter what it takes. Uh, and if that back marker would not be in there, I don't think if I ever managed to overtake him clean, let's call it this way. And why did I have such a determination that way I need to overtake him? Because I did, if I remember right, I did qualify for pole position. I had a very competitive car. And when the race started, I was leading a Grand Prix. And the circuit was a little bit, little bit wet still because it was raining overnight. So I spun. I spun, I think it was five laps in a race before, you know, and I spun. And I kept the engine running. The, the, the car was pointing in the right direction on the track. And I could see Michael Schumacher overtaking. And I could nearly feel his smile inside in a crash helmet. <laughs> I felt that, you know. So I said, that's it. There's no way I'm going to let him win, you know. <laughs> that's so, I mean, there's a very famous photograph after the race, and you and Michael are talking about it, and you're, yeah. and you're showing him what happened. I mean, I think, I think you, you had a conversation with Michael after the race because actually you weren't very happy with some of, some of the battle. Isn't that correct? Yeah, absolutely true. And it was not the, the, the first one and not the last one. But I, I did really, really have a conversation to, to really to, to explain to him that way, you know, when we are going 320 kilometers per hour, you really don't push somebody on the cross. You know, it's, a, it's, a, you, <laughs> it's, it's super dangerous. At a low speed, when you go 80 kilometers per hour, you can, you can play a little bit and make some tricks, but not in 320 kilometers per hour. And he just looked at me and said, Mika, this is racing. <laughs> And I was like, okay, I'll leave it there. Okay, if, if that's your way of thinking. Um, but, uh, but the great, you know, he was, a, he was a big challenge. Great racing driver, but a uh, little, little bit on the limit. We're going to take two more questions, if you can, if you can prepare them. Just before we go into those, or maybe three, I think there's three people going to ask questions. Before we go into them, a kind of final question from me to you is, is today you, work, you still work with the McLaren team. You're an ambassador for... McLaren, um, which is fantastic. 20 years later, you're still working yeah. with that team. Um, at the moment, everyone who follows Formula One knows that the, the orange McLaren cars are in the wrong place. They're at the back instead of at the front. Um, so the team is, is, is having a downward cycle at the moment. Wh what do you believe that that, that group of people, I mean, how are they going to get themselves back to where they want to be winning? And again, tonight, obviously, we've been talking about making decisions under pressure. McLaren are having to make a lot of decisions at the mm. moment to, to get themselves back to the front. How do you think they can do that? Do you think they'll succeed? I believe they will succeed. Uh, and like we discussed earlier, it took me seven years before I won my first Grand Prix, and that's a long time, I tell you. It's like every day when you go to office and you open the door and it's raining for seven years every day. <laughs> <laughs> it comes to day one day, you know, you get enough, you know. So, so uh, again, you know, when you're talking about the mechanics and the designers, the whole group of McLaren, you know, they need the super motivation all the time, even the bad days. Because it's, it's too easy to say that way, oh, the car doesn't work. This is, this is not good but something needs to be done. And who can change this car is the people. You know, you don't just go in a supermarket and you buy <laughs> new tools and two new parts in, in a Formula One car. No, you have to design them, you have to make them. And it's not everybody can do this. So you need talented, specialized people who can do these kind of things. And, and it will take time when you get these right people back in the McLaren to do this kind of work. And, and what I'm confident it will happen. It will take some time. But meanwhile, it's no point to look <coughs> outside of the fence and say, ooh, everything looks so green, I want to go. 
yeah. it's better to focus focus in the team at the moment really and hard because success will come. And I think that's a big that's a big takeaway from working in Formula One. The, particularly the media love to talk about the technology and the money and the complexity of Formula One. Actually, what we find is that the difference between winning and losing in Formula One is down to the people mm. and the culture of the team <coughs> and how they are led. And I think we heard very similar stories about the history of Poland. It's about people, it's about how they're led, it's about their motivation, mm. and then you can achieve amazing uh, things. Now, the final three questions, one from here, this lady, what was your question? So when yeah, you're, when you're in the car, yeah, what do you? Yeah. Th what do you? So the question it's is, a, you know, when you're yeah. in the, when you're in the car, what do you? What is your focus? Are you are you, are you praying to God that you're going to win the race? Are you thinking about your family? Are you thinking? I mean, where is your focus, Mika? It, it's a very good question. And again, I coming back to this seven years. You know, in those seven years, you try everything. You try everything to change all your life differently, that way you become better racing driver. Uh, what is the most important, my opinion, winning, and, and to have this winning method uh, is to have the right people around you. Uh, and, and finding these right people around you, it, it tends to happen very much what you personally, what you have experienced. So, so when I entered the Formula One 91, it didn't mean that way. You come here, you come here. Now I have a great team, great people around me. Now I'm ready. No, it took a, quite a long time me to get first experience and learn to understand the people better. So again, my answer very much for you is is the people around you. And and uh, very important. Mark mentioned earlier that well, you know, the trust is important, and and to trust yourself, to know who you are, feel balanced, and trust yourself that way you are good. And when you look in the mirror and you're telling yourself, Mika, you are the best driver in the world, and if you have a little bit hesitation there, then you are not. You have to be 100% sure, and then you can get your goal. But you have to know. That way you're the best. That's a fantastic answer, really. So really, you trust in yourself. It's your own self-belief. You're, you're focusing on the fact that you are going to deliver uh, the result for the team. Now, the lady here, uh, there's two more questions. Just the lady on the right, yes? Um, oh, there's a microphone there for you, <laughs> very helpfully. Um, is this working? Yeah. So uh, you said about accepting, uh, accepting the mistakes, and I think it's really important. And I'm a sportswoman and I'm sailing, and I've been sailing uh, for 12 years now. And uh, when I'm on the race course, when, when I'm racing, uh, I sail on two people boat and I'm a skipper. I have really big problems to accept these little mistakes. <sighs> and even if the race is not finished yet, and we have a lot of you know, opportunities to gain some places, yeah. uh, we, we make some mistakes together and uh, after even after these 12 years of sailing, I still have problems with accepting these mistakes. It's really hard, and I just want to ask uh, if you have any pieces of advice how how to make it easier. And uh, maybe it depends on you know experience you gain. Maybe it was uh, easier for you after some years. Um, I think I'm still quite young and I'm I'm learning a lot, but it's really hard for me to just to accept these mistakes and to go on, you know? Yeah, and that's normal, your, your, exp your feeling. I, it's normal what you're experiencing, you know, it's, it's, and, and that's, one sense is healthy also, you know, because you have a goal, you want to win. So these mistakes make you upset and it's very logical. And same for me, when I was racing and there was a mistakes, 
what I did. Very simple. I analyzed why these mistakes happened. Was it because the car? Was it because of me? Was it the people? Was it the settings, what the car was set up? And the sailing, I'm sure, there's a lot of different tools, instruments, what you can choose, how to use them or how to design them, and who taking care of the boat and your team. So I, I think it's, a, it's analyzing. So you, you have to know, is it you who's doing something wrong, or is it the tools what you are using, or team who you're working with? So. Um, yeah, yeah, I really agree with you, but uh, when there is a race going, and you just have to keep going, you know, and you make this mistakes, mistake, and you know that you made it, uh, but you have to, you know, um, you can't give up, and it's, uh, for me, it's really hard to, uh, to be this 100% like concentrate uh, for the rest of the race and maybe I'm focusing too much on the, the mistake that I just uh, did. So well, know. I'm not coming sailing with you then. <laughs> no, no, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> not so easy, no? <laughs> so have you, have you heard of the uh, British sailor Ben Ainsley? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I met him even. You met Ben Ainsley? Yeah. So, how do you think Ben Ainsley improved his performance? I'll tell you the story. He actually came to Formula One, and he asked for a data system yeah. to go on his, his dinghy. And he put a data system on his dinghy so that every time he sailed, he was able to download every single time he had tacked, every, yeah. time he, every maneuver, everything that had happened, he was able to look at it on his computer. And he looked at all the mistakes. And then each time he went out, he made sure he didn't repeat. That he took a scientific approach to becoming the best skipper in the world, uh, winning America's Cup and mm -hmm. obviously multiple gold medal winner. So I was working with the organization called Cosworth, which provided the data system for his, for his yacht. And it was very interesting for us in Formula One to see someone from sailing actually using technology in exactly the same way. Mika spent his life looking at data. How, how do we improve? Every time, how do we improve? You do the same, exactly the same in sailing. And that's why, I mean, I'm sure you know, every time Ben Ainsley gives an interview, he talks about America's Cup being the Formula One of sailing, because that's how he sees that kind of mentality uh, in the right way. Um, final question thank from you. this gentleman. Thank you, thank you so much, by the way, for that question. It was great, thank you. Uh, gentleman over here. Moi Mika. Yeah. I just uh, have a one last question. How you can live without that adrenaline which gives you uh, racing? Is it there is something another like woodwork for you which gives <laughs> you that feeling? So how do you live without the adrenaline of racing? Do you, do you have a hobby like woodwork or, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, what's, what, what's the thing that, uh, can you get that excitement elsewhere? By the way, the answer to this question is only for family viewing. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, really, I mean, of course, from La One car, you can imagine what a bus it gives you. You know, you're talking about really high G loads, really, really high speed. Uh, so you don't, you don't just walk in a, in a fun fair and, and go in a roller coaster to experience that, that feeling. So, so uh, for, for me, it's quite easy, you know, to, to get out of that, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to be 50, <laughs> so, so I have to face the reality. So Poland is 100 <laughs> and you're 50, okay, so that's, uh, but, yeah. Yeah, to, but the life, you have to find the new challenges and new goals. I mean, I'm very fortunate, I have five children, I tell you, they keep me awake. They <laughs> give me the adrenaline in the morning, you know. Uh, but uh, Formula One, it was, it was my, my thing. It was my challenge in my life. But, but it came to moment when it was time to, to stop and, and, uh, and to enjoy that what I achieved. Uh, now, the life had taken me in a different route, different ways of in a business. Business life, what I do, my family. And that's, for me, that adrenaline, that excitement, what it gives me. And I can see the success in my family, how the kids gonna grow up, uh, business, how that's gonna develop, working with the people in a business. 
it can be very much compared like in Formula One. But I, I can tell you this is only part of the answer to the question because if you follow Mika Hakkinen on social media, you will know that he has a McLaren P1, okay? Which is a pretty amazing, and I think you quite like that car. I think you get a little bit of adrenaline just looking at it, oh, yeah, sure. e even before driving it. I mean, it's... Yeah, it's, a, it's a, just a great car. It, it, it has, has quite a lot of horsepower, like 1,000 horsepower, so it's, it's a very quick car. But we're talking about driving a public road, so you've got to go flat out, even though I would like to. Do you do the school, <laughs> do you do the school run in the McLaren P1? Yeah, I do, and it's sometimes, you know, <laughs> in Monaco, you know, when I'm taking my kids in the school in the morning and driving, driving the same, same, you know, road like a racetrack, you know, it's, it's a bit funny to go 30 kilometers per hour. Well, I, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we'll finish on that note. How cool to have the school run with your dad being Mika Hakkinen on the streets of Monte Carlo. I mean, that's <laughs> like, like, that's like the coolest thing that you could possibly imagine turning up at school. Mika Hakkinen, two times world champion. Thank, thank you, you very much Cheers, for tonight. Thank you very thank much you. indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Can I just... Um, Can I just on behalf of uh, Mika Hakkinen and myself, Mark Gallagher, thank the Polish National Foundation, to thank Robert, to thank the leadership team, uh, to thank the Prime Minister's office for their hospitality today, to thank all of you for coming here this evening, and to say what a great privilege it's been for us to visit your country, visit your city, have the chance to meet some of you this evening, and to have a, a talk about Mika's life and at the top of Formula One to share that uh, with you. We hope that if it's not Robert Kubica, we hope that Robert or another Polish driver becomes a winner in Formula One, that the sport becomes even bigger again uh, in this country. Um, and thank you very much indeed for your attention this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>